so this is a pretty good turnout. Um, if you can see up there, that's me about a week and a half ago thinking about what I wanted to talk to you guys about today. And it really came down to three things. I wanted to talk about something that I thought would be pretty useful to you. And I also wanted to talk about something that hopefully you haven't heard before, it's somewhat unique. And I guess thirdly, I wanted to talk about something that's derived from a lot of my experiences over the last three years, because I don't think that you should talk about anything unless you've actually been through something. And so I'm just going to kind of walk you through what I want to talk to you about, which is essentially how do you apply AI. And first, what you typically do is you go out and find a problem or an opportunity. And then once you feel you've understood the problem, you think of all the amazing ways an AI could actually solve that problem. And then you go out and you find some people that are super passionate, want to join you on this mission and build the AI and sell it for you. And then you go out and get a bunch of money to fund the whole thing. And while you're building your AI system, and this one it's potentially like a classifying type of service, uh, you go, you get some raw data, then you start to label that data, and then at some point you have enough data where you have reliable output, and then you exponentially scale, and then everything is awesome. And that's all you have to do. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty simple, but then... <laughs> so I'm done, I'm done. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Sure. Oh, okay. Uh, maybe. I'll see if I can figure it out. So what I was saying is everything is awesome, and you don't have to do anything else. That's how you do it. But the reality is once you start doing this, you just get slapped in the face and you get slapped in the face not with a soccer ball, but with time. And what I mean by that is time starts to run out. Um, because you haven't really focused on how you're going to generate and deliver value, or how you're going to get to cash flow positive. Um, those are two pretty key things in making your business sustainable while you're trying to build this AI service. And eventually your money runs out. And then eventually you have to say goodbye to those people you hired that were super excited to work with you. And then eventually you have to say goodbye to the robot or the AI you're trying to build. And if it gets worse, you have to say goodbye to the whole thing that got you started, which is the dream of solving the problem. And you might end up like this guy. You might have to actually go to an island and then make friends with the beach ball because you've lost all your friends. <laughs> so this is the reality for a lot of people that try to build startups. Um, some, most of them don't actually end up on an island like this. Some of them do. Um, <laughs> I've been through, I guess this is the second startup I've been working with, which is Virum. The first one I did um, failed, and I got close to this point. And it really sucks when you start running out of money and you start saying goodbye to the people that you hired, looking them in the face and saying you can't actually work here anymore because we've run out of money. And you start to get attached to the technology you build after two years, and it sucks saying goodbye to that. And then it just sucks saying goodbye to the whole reason you got started in the first place, which you just kind of feel like, well, what was I doing the last two years? So um, fortunately, you can view that in a positive light and take a lot of learning experience just from that. And um, hopefully, you can learn a lot so you don't ever get to this situation. And so I guess a few months after my first um, startup I was a part of kind of crumbled, um, that's when I got involved with the project that eventually became Virum, as it's known today. And what I wanted to talk to you about today was basically um, this concept of how do you build an AI-enabled service um, in two different ways. One is you can go whole hog and develop your AI model from day one. And the second is using an approach, what I like to call the human in the loop approach, which the more technical term is just basically supervised learning. And what I wanted to do is basically take you through the journey of creating this service in each of those two scenarios, and then compare the amount of time and money that it takes. because. From my perspective, there's an obvious winner on the way to actually build AI-enabled services in terms of time and money. And I want to show you this with some very extreme scenarios, and these are scenarios that we faced at Virum. So um, when we first started trying to figure out what we wanted to build, we realized there was no labeled data available in the public domain. None of it even existed that we could purchase. There wasn't any, even any raw data that we could actually take and label. Um, that didn't even exist. We actually had to generate a lot of that ourselves. And in terms of output, the kinds of uh, classification systems you want to build were in the 3D space, which about three years ago 
was pretty much just in the uh, labs of universities. So um, even if we got all that data, we probably couldn't even make a reliable output back then. But we still managed to survive as a company and move forward towards this path, which I'll go through shortly. So before I do that, I want to tell you a bit about why I want to talk to you about this. So a lot of people think that time equals money. I tend to think that's bullshit. I think time is way more valuable than money, and not just a bit, but a lot. And the reason for that is, if you look at all the global challenges that the world is facing, um, things like cancer, we haven't solved that yet. A lot of people are going to get cancer. I think the statistics in Canada is like one out of two people are going to get cancer. Um, food's going to be a huge problem. We're going to have lots of food shortages, and the current way we produce food is very poor on the actual human health. And thirdly, um, we have this thing called climate change, which is pretty eminent in the next 30 years if we don't try to solve that. So time's pretty critical for these. Um, looking at Calgary's future, it's pretty uncertain right now. Uh, we used to have a very bustling economy here due to the oil and gas industry, but um, due to the downturn in oil and gas, um, I don't think it's ever going to go back to where it used to be relying on oil and gas. So we have to find ways to diversify our economy, and I think the tech sector is one way that has a ton of potential to actually increase the potential that we have in Calgary here in terms of economics and make it a pretty prosperous city over the next 10 years. And then we have all you. So I guess the reason I have this up on the screen is I know a lot of you are either thinking about getting into the tech scene or maybe you're already in the tech scene and you're trying to think about how do I create AI-enabled services. Uh, maybe you're already successful at doing that and maybe you're just thinking, well, how do I optimize what I'm doing and, and avoid any risks that might pop up in the future? And really what I see is that the people in this room are, are part of the, you might be in the tech scene sooner or you're, in, or you're in it right now. And we have a big impact on what we can do for Calgary's future here if we do a lot of things right over the next 10 years. And so really applying AI to me, I think time is the common thread between those three things. And if you want to apply it, there's kind of two key aspects to that. And the first is artificial intelligence, which is the theme of the meetup here. And I think AI has so much potential to solve all these problems that the world's facing and to help Calgary move into a prosperous future and to help all of you kind of create all these very unique services or businesses or products. And before I go into this too much further, I just want to get some definitions. So um, I searched what artificial intelligence meant on Google, and this is the first result from Technopedia. It defined it as intelligent machines that work and react like humans. I personally I think that's a bit limited because I think there's a lot of different kinds of intelligence that could exist that isn't human-like. And we've already seen that in games like, uh, or in systems like uh, AlphaGo, where they've kind of described as this alien intelligence that beat all these super experts at AlphaGo, or uh, sorry, at the game of Go. And so I like to think of it in this way from, from this book, The Hidden Pattern, which is one of my favorite books. Um, if you haven't read it, definitely check it out. And it describes it as the ability to achieve complex goals in a complex environment with insufficient knowledge and resources. So I think that's a pretty good way to describe it, and it's not limiting it in any way. So that's artificial intelligence. Now, the other key ingredient to this is the service side, which is more the business side. And if you're going to find a good definition on service, the best place to look is the Urban Dictionary, obviously. So I searched what service would mean, and this is what it told me as the top definition. <laughs> And so the funny part is 666 people liked that, and then 83 people didn't. And I'm one of the 83, I didn't like that one, because I, really, I don't think it really gets at the essence of what a service is. So I checked out Oxford Dictionaries, and came at, this is the definition, the action of helping or doing work for somebody. And I highlighted the word helping because I think that's really what a service is all about. It takes a lot of empathy, uh, compassion and understanding to actually help somebody. And that's often the piece that I see is missing with a lot of these um, tech startups, is they're really good at the tech side and they kind of forget about the service side and forget about that they're actually trying to help people with their technology. And so with those two in mind, you might be asking how do you actually combine AI and services to help people? So there's a few ways you can do this. Probably one of the more classical ways you can, you can offer predictive services. So you can look at historical data predict future trends, future events, and, uh, and people like that because they'd like to know the future, and it really helps them to get a better sense of where things are going. Um, this is more on the bleeding edge, I'd say, but um, if you look at systems like the one that was developed to defeat the best players in the world at Go, 
Um, that utilizes a lot of deep reinforcement learning techniques. And if you can get a very accurate simulation environment to put these agents into, you can actually come up with some pretty incredible intelligence about how to optimize things. So I think this is the future of some pretty big opportunities in AI. Um, there's already some companies that are focused on delivering services around this. But what I'm here to talk to you about today is the type of service I like to call one second judgment services. And what I mean by that is I'll give you an example to kind of think about what that means. So think about you're driving down the road in your vehicle and you're trying to get to this destination. And you're trying to get there as fast as possible, so ideally a straight line. The problem is there's some constraints along your journey here. And you are trying to avoid hurting yourself and rolling your car. And you're trying to avoid hitting pedestrians. And you should probably obey the traffic signs because they're, they're there to help you and you might get a large fine if you disobey them. And so basically what you do as you're driving is, is you look at the scene around you. And this is essentially what um, the start of a uh, key component of the autonomous driving system do. You look at the scene around you and you say, well, where, where are the humans? Which ones are humans? Which ones are the vehicles? Where are the sidewalks? Where are the roads? Where are the traffic signs? And then based on your understanding of the environment around you, you can make some very quick judgments around, am I about to hurt myself? Am I gonna hurt somebody else? Or am I going to disobey a law? And we're so good at doing this that we probably don't even think we do this. We just kind of do it subconsciously almost a lot of the times. But this is where a tremendous amount of opportunity in AI lies from my perspective because a lot of jobs that people do out there rely on a lot of these one second judgments to actually accomplish the job. So if you think about it, um, lawyers kind of quickly scan a document to see if it looks bad, if the grammar's wrong. Um, people that, that are trying to, uh, I guess doctors when they're looking at uh, MRIs, they're trying to quickly see if there's any cancer cells in that, in that image. And if you can show them where that part of the image is, they can make that decision in under, under a second. And due to recent advancements in AI, in such as deep reinforcement learning tech, or sorry, uh, deep learning techniques, and increased availability of data sets and increased hardware, these types of judgments are now automatable, which is super cool. And so, really this is what the focus of has been at Virum, is trying to figure out how to actually build these one second judgment services. Um, it's from a, kind of like a core IP's perspective. And so, combining these two, there's some key ingredients to a service. So, if you're gonna build a service, you have to be able to generate and deliver value. Um, you have to be able to get to cash flow positive at some point, because if you don't, you're gonna close shop, or you have to always rely on external services to fund you, which takes a lot of time. And at some point, it would be really good to exponentially scale that service so that you can help as many people as possible. And then as I mentioned before on the AI side, there's some challenges in actually hitting these on the service side. You have to get reliable output of your model first. Um, second, you have to get labeled data. If you don't have that, it, there's a lot of time and money spent labeling data. And third, you need raw data to actually label. So um, there's a huge cost in time of getting raw data if you don't have that as well. And so the common thread around this, as I mentioned before, is time. How do you actually do all this given time is running out constantly and you're constantly running out of money? So now I'm gonna to get to the meat of the presentation. So where do you actually start? How do you actually start building one of these services? So I think the best place to start is to focus on value generation and delivery. And what I'm gonna show you is kind of the relationship of time to that. So to do that, start with asking the question, who do you actually want to help? Because you should have some attachment to, and, and some desire to help some people. And then ask what value are you actually gonna to give to these people? And then once you know that, you have to come up with an answer to, will they actually pay you for that value? And not only do you have to answer that for them, you have to answer that for another kind of larger group. Um, you have to answer, will others pay you for the same value? And then while you're doing this, you're trying to think of all the ways that you can actually generate and deliver value. You have to think, can this value be generated and delivered automatically? Because if you can't do it automatically, you can't exponentially scale. And so typically a really good way to do this is, um, applying lean startup methodologies. So the idea with that is you come up with hypothesis to these questions and then you go out and build something which they call an MVP, a minimum viable product. And then that lets you basically test the value of your hypothesis and you can measure it because you can deliver that MVP to people and see them use it and then ask them if it actually solved what you were trying to solve. And then you can learn and you can iterate that way and it kind of goes in this very fast iterative cycle. So how do you actually deliver value? That's kind of the framework to creating value. How do you deliver it? So looking at the people you want to help, 
Um, there's a framework out there called the Jobs Be Done, which is essentially the key tasks they do in either their job or their daily life that they're um, kind of the most important things that they do. And if you want to learn more about that, I recommend just searching it. There's a lot of good content on it. And then once you know their jobs, you start to figure out which, which of these one second judgments do they actually need to perform to accomplish these jobs. Once you know these judgments, then you say what information do, you, what information do they need to actually come up with these judgments and have successful judgments. And looking at the example I showed you before about driving a car, so in this example, the job to be done is they want to get to the destination without hurting myself, others, or breaking laws. And the information they use is the past states, so people typically can remember where they were in the last three seconds and what the scene was in front of them in the last three seconds, and then what their current state is. And then those judgments, like I said, are, are should I, should I basically accelerate, decelerate, turn so I don't hurt myself, hit someone else, or avoid any, or I guess, uh, or break any traffic laws. And so what I found is that people are actually very good at doing their jobs and very good at making judgments, um, but they often get a lot of bad information. And so if they get bad information, they're gonna make bad judgments and they're not gonna be good at the jobs they're trying to do. And so really to me, all the value comes from the concept of information, so making information better for people. So you can kind of distill information value into three areas. One is completeness, so do you actually have all the information you need to actually make a judgment? Um, in the self, in the kind of the driving scenario, if you were to get on your phone and text and not look at the road, you wouldn't have any information, so you'd obviously make bad judgments if you're about to hit somebody. Another is uh, accuracy. So how accurate is the data that you're getting? You might get all the data, but it might not be accurate, so you're still making bad judgments. If you're driving a car and you're super sleepy, you might be so tired that you start hallucinating and then start seeing things that aren't actually there and start kind of altering your judgments. And the third is timeliness. So you can have complete accurate information, but if it doesn't get to you in time to make your judgments, you're still gonna make really bad judgments. And if you think about driving, let's say, let's say you've had like 10 drinks at the bar and you decide to drive for some stupid reason, your uh, circuitry in your brain is going to fire a lot slower and you'll likely make some very bad judgments even though you think all, you have all the information in front of you. And so that's really where the value of information comes from. And so I'll show you a specific example of how we did this at Virum. So Virum is all about uh, reducing the cost and, and the time and the risk with creating the world's critical infrastructure. And the people that manage these projects that actually, where the infrastructure is actually created are they, they're called project managers. So really we focused on them first and trying to figure out how to help them. And we found there, this is a kind of a, a very vague way to say it, but they make a lot of project decisions. And so they make decisions, many decisions throughout the day, they make decisions on a weekly basis, they make longer decisions on a monthly basis. And the information that they get, that they rely on to make these decisions is essentially a schedule of what's, what they're trying to do. What the quality is of that, of that construction is thing, are things actually being built correctly and then what the progress is, so are things on track, basically. And they're trying to make these judgments based off this information, so is it on track, what's the quality? And if they have all that, those judgments are pretty fast to make, like they can make those pretty quick. And then with those judgments, they can come up with their, with their better decisions around how do I prioritize my projects and then how do I assign resources? Do I assign resources, do I assign more people to this project? Do I put more cash in this project? Those kind of decisions. And so, after talking to a lot of these project managers, we learned that they're kind of very bad at getting all the information they need in all those areas. So it's never timely enough, it's never accurate enough, and it's never complete enough. And really that was really focused around the quality and progress of that information, or the information around quality and progress. And so we asked, well, where is that information coming from? How do you get that information right now? And for the sake of this presentation, I'm just gonna call it the project team, but um, really, it comes from a variety of sources. It can come from surveyors, geospatial engineers, project engineers, project controllers. Um, that would make this too confusing, so I'm just gonna simplify it and say project team. And this team, is their, their main job is they need to report progress and quality to these project managers, so they go through the same cycle there. And so, that is essentially how you deliver value to the project manager, is making this project team, increasing their ability to actually report progress and quality. And so, how do you generate value? That's how you deliver value. How do you actually generate it? 
So same thing, just look at the information they get. So these guys rely a lot on the schedule, uh, this concept of reality, which is basically the current state of the construction site or the fabrication that they're doing, and then the design, which is the 3D models of what they're trying to build. And the judgments these people make are, is reality, is reality, what's like it's, is reality, does reality match design, and then does reality match the schedule? And if they know those two things, then they can come up with these reports for their project managers. And so these people, they're also not getting good information. Um, it's either too, too untimely, too inaccurate, too com incomplete, and thus they can't make these judgments. And so really there's a huge link here between increasing the quality of the information on the left, and if you do that, it will basically increase the, information on the, the quality of the information on the right. And so I'll just show you a quick example of the kind of the information that the project team looks at. So this is a facility. It's a reality scan of a facility that's in our platform. And what they would do is they would try to look at this and, and uh, figure out where all the issues are. And these things can be kilometers in size. And uh, trying to do that on a daily basis is pretty much impossible. And so they're trying to find issues like this. So once you put this in front of one of them, they can make a judgment in under one second about is that right or not. So that kind of pink color is what they're trying to, trying to build, that's the design. And then the, um, the other color there, the grayer color, that's basically what they actually scanned. So the actual judgment that has to be made here is pretty simple. I don't think you even need to be in the industry to know that that's well, What issue. you do is you kind of start to quantify these ideas of completeness, accuracy, and timeliness. And those inform how you're gonna build this. So the completeness informs what kind of data you need, the accuracy, that informs um, what kind of performance you need out of your AI model. And then the timeliness, that informs what kind of computing you need. So um, you can think of this as, do you need a CPU? Do you need GPUs? Do you need multiple ones? Should you parallelize your code to shorten it or do you need to just leave it in series because timeliness doesn't matter? So. The idea is to not over-engineer solutions. The idea is to deliver the value you need to deliver. Um, and so basically, if you were to go with the whole hog kind of let's develop an AI model first approach to replace this project team, this is what it would look like. So what you want to do with this is use, is try to quantify what completeness they need, what timeliness they need. Use those as your constraints. And then start to use accuracy as your objective, which is basically the performance of your AI model. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put accuracy on its side, and then say, as you go up the page here, that's the increase in value of accuracy. And so you'd ask your project manager what level of completeness and timeliness is good with you, and then you'd say, given those, what desired level of accuracy do you want? They're probably gonna say, I want 100% accuracy, and you'd be like, okay, cool. We'll get there someday, maybe. And then, <laughs> don't say it like that, but <laughs> try to make them feel like you're very confident about getting there. So after that, you wanna ask them, well, where are you currently at with accuracy? Like how accurate are you right now in getting this information? And you wanna, you wanna quantify where that is. And then the next question is, well, what, if I was to actually increase the accuracy to the next level, what would that be? And not talking about the desired level, but a level that would make you adopt what I'm trying to build. And so really that's the key to this exercise here that really informs how you're gonna generate and deliver value is finding out that value of X right there. And so if you look at this from a time perspective, um, putting time on the X axis there, you can actually change that X to say MVP, which is that concept I talked about before. You can remove that current line and then you can remove the adoption value because it's redundant and MVP covers that. And you can simplify this whole thing to say that MVP represents the level of accuracy needed to actually deliver value. And then you can change the word accuracy to just value. And so what I'm gonna show you is the relationship of time um, in terms of actually developing an AI model and then when you hit that value threshold where this project manager would actually say, I will use your service. So the question is how do you deliver and generate value? So you start right there, you can see that blue um, circle at the bottom left of the chart. So day one, you're obviously not gonna generate any value. But as time goes on, um, if you're gonna develop an AI model, first thing you need to do is figure out a way you're gonna ingest data and then do some light processing maybe so that you can feed this data into the AI model. And then um, you also need to create some infrastructure around that and then think of a way you're gonna actually deliver that information to this project manager. So the act of doing that doesn't really actually add any value because the project manager still gets the information in that same kind of shitty way. But 
once you have that in place, you can actually start to develop your AI model and train it. And this is the case where you have all data available to you. Um, essentially, it's pretty fast to actually train these things if you have the right data. So you can hit that adoption threshold quite fast, and you can deliver this to the project manager. Um, and then the interesting part about this is, depending on the problem, it usually takes a lot longer to get to closer to 100%. You're probably never going to get to 100%, but you have to work through a lot of edge cases once you get your kind of first threshold, um, th first threshold passed in your AI model in terms of accuracy. And so that reason alone is why it's super important to actually not try to deliver this 100% this accurate model right away because it would take so long to actually develop that that, this, that you might run out of cash and there's just a huge time difference between hitting that desired and the adoption level there. So that hopefully shows you how um, the time relationship works with value. Now what about this concept of cash flow positive? So cash flow positive, it's pretty simple what, what this is. It's just your money in equals your money out. So how do you get money in? So there's three main sources, I'd say. You can go talk to investors, you can get customers to pay you, or you can get the government to give you grants. So there's some key things to keep in mind when you're thinking about the ways you want to get money in. One is time. Investors take a lot of time to go out and convince to give you money, and once you get money, you have to talk to them a lot, which takes a lot of time. Government also takes a lot of time because you have to fill out these very large proposals. Um, and basically go back and forth. And if you're not experienced in doing that, that could take months to actually get some money. And then once you get that, then you have to basically do some reporting, which takes a bunch more time about how the project's going. And I'm not saying these are bad areas to actually go and uh, get money. I'm just saying they take a lot of time because we've had a lot of success at Virum getting government money and investor money. Um, the other idea, the other concept to think, think about here is the idea of leverage. So. If you don't have any tech, you don't have any kind of uh, validation on your value, you're not gonna have a lot of leverage when you go talk to these investors, so they're probably gonna take a huge amount of your equity, which really constrains you with your freedom, which is super important to me. And that means a lot of things on the, um, on the uh, more of the business side. If you're just starting out, likely you're gonna pivot a few times, and your initial idea of what you wanna build isn't what you actually find works for the product market fit. And so you're gonna kind of upset these investors and, and the government grants if you end up doing something else rather than what you initially told them. So it kind of shackles you that way. Um, on, the more, on the more personal note, it kind, of, uh, it kind of shackles you because as a the person that's kind of starting these endeavors, you don't wanna feel like you're tied down. And if, once you feel like you're tied down, then it kind of, uh, kind of ruins the experience in some ways. But what I'm trying to say with this is that customers are your best bet to get money in in so many ways because if you can get money in from customers, then you've proven that you can deliver value to them. And that's really the whole point of what we're trying to do here. So really money in to me equals customers, number of customers time the, times the price that you're offering your service. And your money out is pretty simple too. It's just your operating costs plus your capital costs. And capital costs are your one-time costs. Think about the cost to purchase like a data set. And so in the middle here, you have what I talked about before, your, your value. And as I said, your customers inform what value you're gonna generate, deliver. And then that informs your price. And then that also informs your costs for your operating capital. So it's all pretty linked here and it's, it's pretty simple at the end of the day. And really what this is for me is a sustainable business model, which I think everybody should try to figure out how to do this because if you can do this, um, cash, you don't have to freak out about cash every night. And you don't have to freak out about your business shutting down. And it's a, pretty, um, it's a pretty free place to be, I'd say, if you can get there. So how do you actually, what does the relationship be between time and cash flow positive look like? So x-axis time, on the left, you have your initial idea there, and on the right, at some point in the future, you have cash flow positive. Um, on the top here, you have, on the y-axis, business model uncertainty, which is essentially saying, how uncertain are you that you figured out everything you need to figure out to have a sustainable business? So as you go up in that chart, you are more uncertain. And this is what the journey to cash flow positive looks like in a lot of ways for people that are starting up. So usually you'll be pretty confident when you have your initial idea. You're like, I've already figured it out. I just need to go sell this and build it. And then you start talking with people and you're like, wow, I actually don't know what I'm talking about. I need to go learn a lot from these people and learn what they actually need. And that whole process is pretty, um, it's pretty up and down. And over time, if you apply lean startup methodologies, you can shorten the, 
the frequency of these ups and downs and eventually converge at what I like to call the product market fit, which is where you have a bunch of people you paying you money for the same value. And that's the precursor to cash flow positive because if you don't have that, you can't get cash flow positive because it's a, it's a custom service at the end of the day that you have to customize to each person. And so one of the key milestones here as well is the idea of the MVP, which you're trying to get out as fast as you can so that you can shorten these, uh, these cycles here and actually get to cash flow positive faster. So that's the relationship between time and cash flow positive. Now I'll show you how this looks in relation to the time to generate value because they are super interlinked. So on the top here you have the value at versus time that we talked about before, which is if you go whole hog with developing an AI model first, that's how much time it's going to take to deliver that threshold of MVP value. And really hitting that threshold right there is basically what is basically the event on this, this axis down here that hits your MVP. And uh, sometime after that, you'll hit your product market fit. And then at some point in the future, hopefully shortly after, you'll be cash flow positive. And so there's, and then that's the journey obviously right there. And so there's two key intersection points that are really important to talk about. So this, this part right here where you hit MVP on this uncertainty timeline is really based off this. So that's why you want to set the actual value you want to deliver lower, but enough to get people to adopt because if you don't, it will get pushed out further, which will push out your cash flow positive further. And this part is also important because you're not going to be able to deliver this, this level of accuracy and value to everybody. Early adopters might like that, but the concept of crossing, crossing the chasm, and if you haven't heard about it, is you have to go and service the early majority too, which those people typically want a higher level of reliability and accuracy. So to get those people to use your model, you'd probably need to increase the accuracy to somewhere around there, which that informs your product market fit right there when that's going to actually happen. And so that's cool in the, um, that's how it works in the, uh, the case where you have data, but what about this? whole cold data start problem where you don't actually have any data, what does that look like? So the value versus time on top actually looks something like that. And the reason it looks like that is because at this point, um, you gotta figure out the strategy around how you're actually gonna get this data and then how you're gonna actually label it. So you might be able to get a lot of raw data at the start here, but you still need to label it, which is this kind of process right here. And then once you start to hit that threshold of data that makes your model work, it'll start to look a little bit like that graph before. And so really this pushes out your MVP a lot because you can't deliver anything until you hit that. And then your product market fit and your cash flow positive are even further out. And the journey looks a lot like that. It's harder to actually um, do the feedback cycles faster. And so if you contrast that with the original idea where you have data, um, that's kind of the difference of, of cash flow positive time, which is it's quite a bit if you don't have the data. So if you don't have the data, Basically, that's, that's kind of the big thing I'm trying to get at here is the relationship between generating, delivering value and when you're going to hit cash flow positive in terms of time and what that looks like if you don't have the data. And so what I'm going to talk about now is basically if you have, uh, is basically the concept of not developing an AI model first but using the concept of uh, the human in the loop instead. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So. This was your original idea to go out and build an AI model like this to actually deliver value. So instead of delivering an AI model, let's say you just go find someone that does this job right now and they're really excited about making, about solving the problem that you want to solve and join you on your team. And instead of actually getting an AI to produce this output, you just go find someone that does this and can produce that output for you. And essentially you put them in the loop of the system that you're building. And if you do that, then you don't need to develop as much on the ingestion side or processing side. You still need to develop a little bit, but you don't need to develop as much. And then what that looks like is something like this, so this green curve right here. So because this person is already pretty capable, um, they might need some better information, as I talked about before, which comes from this ingestion and processing side, to actually come up with these judgments. So this kind of timeline right here is basically the time to build this so that they can actually get information. And that's a pretty big change in the, the amount of time it takes to get to the MVP. And you can even shorter it even more. So the reality is these people, they don't, they're not asking you for a web app, they're not asking you for a mobile app, they're just asking you for information. So you can actually get away with just giving people PDF reports to start. And that's what we did at Virum. We didn't even have a web app to start with. We just 
did this and then basically gave people PDF reports and there was a tremendous amount of value in that. And so let's look at this from a kind of a comparative standpoint. So this is what I just talked about, putting the human in, in the loop. This is if you develop an AI model first with data. And then this is basically the relative change in the time it takes to get to cash flow positive. So if you put a human in the loop to get to product market fit, you're gonna hit cash flow positive a lot faster, which is awesome. And then comparing that against the worst case scenario, you don't have any data, it's even huger. So if you're gonna take away one thing from today, I would take away this slide because that length of time is the difference between having a successful business and turning out like this guy. <laughs> so I think it's, for me, it's a pretty compelling reason to start with the human in the loop approach. And I'll go into kind of ideas about doing AI development in parallel to that a little bit later. And so that's the relationship between um, basically value generation, cash flow positive, and um, scenarios where cold data starts um, if you use the human in the, in the loop approach. And for me, that kind of turns time on its head, which is pretty cool. And it also eliminates the need to actually ha actually have to have any training or label data. If you really wanted to, you could actually do this without having to spend any money or time on getting data in and, and classifying it. So that's cool, that's, that's cool, that's, that's about the time. And now what about the money? How does the money compare with this? So um, basically there's, on the left here, there's three main areas that you can um, talk about money in terms of what it's spent on in services. So you have your team, um, you have any kind of development you need to do, and then you have the cost of data. And so what I'm gonna do is basically compare these two approaches. This is the human in the loop approach, and then this is developing an AI model to deliver initial value. And so if you're gonna develop an AI model, you typically need someone that can actually develop AI models, which they call AI developers. If you wanna go this approach, you don't need an AI developer to start. You can just get a technical domain expert, someone that can interface with your software. Um, for those, both of these, you'll probably need a software developer as well. And then you have yourself, if you're the person starting this endeavor, who can do all the sales and, and kind of the business side to start with. And remember, this is just a cash flow positive. This isn't kind of scaling up past that, which you would probably need more people for. So comparing these two, um, I don't know if you've looked at how much AI developers ask for, but it's quite a bit compared to people that already have uh, jobs in kind of these standardized industries. So the right approach, way more costly to get to cash, cash flow positive. So what about the actual development? So as I said before, a lot more to develop on the AI model side rather than just putting a human in the loop. And so again, the right side, way more costly to actually hit cash flow positive. And finally, data. So as I said, if you don't have data, it's actually probably the most expensive part to go find this data and label it. And the left approach, you don't actually need it to hit cash flow positive. So again, right side, huge cost compared to the left side. So you might be saying, well, that's nice. Aren't you supposed to kind of automate this at some point? Aren't you supposed to be developing AI models? Like, how do you actually scale? You can't get this person to scale for you because they can only do so many things in a day. So that's the big question. How do you scale? Do you just get this person to work harder and sweat? So I would love to tell you, but I'm out of time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, there's a lot I wanted to talk to you about, but I wanted to keep it short and within the time frame today. So if you're interested, I can come back for another talk to talk about the scaling side. But uh, here's a quick summary of kind of how this works post cash flow positive. So basically what you wanna do is put these two, the human in the loop and your AI development in parallel, get them working together. And then basically this human is your, is your, you're basically the person that trains the AI model. So it's basically supervised learning. And then at some point in the future, you can get rid of this human and then replace it with the AI, which was kind of that initial scenario. And so what that looks like on here is basically, I guess what that looks like from a scaling standpoint, and if you do this in parallel, which is kind of the concept here, is, is um, you can actually use the data that's generated by the person from that green line when they're first starting to actually ingest and process and deliver this data. And then that actually helps accelerate the amount of data that you need to make your model hit the MVP stage. And there's other concepts here too. So um, there's ideas around like sh shadowing the human with the AI model and then doing that until you reach a significant amount of um, reliable um, outputs and then basically transferring them. So there's lots of really interesting things you can talk about in terms of scaling this up.
there's also ideas around kind of outsourcing the whole labeling side of things and and uh, kind of getting uh, yeah more of an outsourced approach to that too. So I'd love to go into that more later, but I want to keep it short for today. So that's basically what I talked about today. So how do you do all that? Um, these two these two approaches to doing that first the approach basically developing the AI model to hit your cash flow positive and the second approach with the human in the loop. And then showed you basically the difference in time and money in those two and hopefully it's pretty compelling which one to start with if your goal is cash flow positive. And hopefully that helps you. I don't know where you're at in terms of your journey in, in uh, AI. Maybe you're someone that's doing this already. Maybe you're someone that wants to get into it more. Maybe you've already done this successfully and I can learn from you too. So I'm not saying this is the right way to do it, but it's a way that's worked for us. And hopefully, with all this information, you can avoid this scenario. And if you're thinking of getting into this and starting, hopefully that kind of puts your fears at bay that you won't turn into this eventually. And then hopefully that makes Calgary's future better too. So hopefully we can learn something from this and then we can have more successful AI services uh, being generated here in Calgary. And then hopefully some of those are approaching global challenges. I'd love to see Calgary tackle more global challenges, so things in the healthcare sector and things in the food sector. And so maybe we can actually make everything awesome. That would be the ideal situation. And so I just wanted to give a, a quick um, kind of uh, call for what Viram's looking for right now. If you were interested in what I talked about and want to see if there's something that uh, might be there for you at Viram, we're currently looking to add uh, two more people on our tech, or uh, Rob, our CTO in the back there. He's got his hand up. Talk to him after because I might have to take off right away if you're interested. And that's it. Thank you for your time.